So what we're going to do is we're here to expose it, let people tell their story, and let them, let everybody in the public see the horrors of the court system in Suffolk County, New York. Long Island Backstory with Chief Correspondent Gary Jacobs. Good evening, I'm Gary Jacobs and welcome to another edition of Long Island Backstory where we film at the Cablevision Studios here in Hopog, New York. Uh, as a president of Americans for Legal Reform, one of the oldest legal reform groups in the United States, one of the most common things that people come to us with these days, especially here on Long Island, is issues with foreclosures, uh, with the banks uh, taking their homes uh, through divorce, and they ask us what to do, and it's a very difficult thing for us to do. And in fact, trying to find a guest for the show tonight, I put out there on Facebook, does anybody have an expert in foreclosures? Shockingly, very few people came back. I had four or five people, and I ended up picking our, our next guest because he seemed the most knowledgeable. There were a lot of attorneys who handled it, but they did it as an, an ancillary, maybe as part of divorce or as part of uh, bankruptcy. My opinion is the reason probably is not so many of them is because there's not a shitload of money in this business because if you're losing your home, you probably don't have a lot of money. Whereas if you're getting divorced at the beginning, at least you have a lot of, uh, you still have a lot of money left. So um, this is a big issue. In fact, Newsday did a report that over 17,000 homes, 17,000 homes are either in foreclosure or pending foreclosure. That is a huge huge number. So let me tell you about my next guest. Uh, my next guest is Frank Romano. He's an attorney for 23 years. He doesn't look, he looks like a young guy. He must be having a good life. But uh, 23 years, he has an office in Smithtown, where I live. Uh, general practice with an emphasis on litigation and in particular, foreclosure defense litigation. So you're on the good side. I'm one of the good guys. Okay, Frank, well, welcome to the program. It's Thanks fun. for... Uh, taking the time out to uh, to talk to me. I know when we spoke and I said, wow, you're gonna get a lot of business from doing the show. And you said, I don't even have a website and people just keep finding me because it's such a big, big problem uh, here on Long Island. Thanks for having me, Gary. Right. Yeah, and you know, I do absolutely no marketing and my phone rings off the hook because of referrals. And uh, I've handled many, many, many cases, a big part of my practice, and it's a huge problem on Long Island. So t let's just start at the beginning. Tell me a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and how you ended up getting into this field of uh, uh, foreclosures. Well, uh, you know, in my other life, I was a CPA, and I did that for a very brief period of time and realized that I uh, didn't really like it. And then uh, one of my accounting friends said, you'd be a good lawyer. And I ended up making the transition and becoming an attorney right after that. So uh, I handled uh, a couple of foreclosure matters 20 years ago when I first started. And so I've, I'm, I've been familiar with foreclosure for many, many years. And then about 10 or 12 years ago when we had the uh, real estate implosion and the, the market just dropped and the mortgage industry cratered, more and more people started having problems with their mortgages. And, um, you know, I had a background in it and I started working on a few cases and then next thing you know it just snowballed and referral after referral um, came to me through. So it just, just happened, it, it evolved. It kind of just happened. I had a few of them because I had clients who had problems and they said, can you help me? And I said, sure. And, uh, you know, I had, like I said, I had a background and a lot of the people that are doing it now, a lot of the attorneys that are doing it now, they sort of jumped into it because it became big business. Like right. you said, 17,000 cases. Uh, that's a, big, that's a big customer base. It's a big customer base. It's a big customer base. So tell me, let's, let's go to the beginning. Now, somebody's falling behind on their mortgage. They lost their job. They got medical bills. Uh, probably one of the most common ones is they got divorced, <laughs> unfortunately, and they can't find it. What do you do when you start to fall behind? I mean, do you just send in a little bit of money? Do you, what do you do when you say, okay, my mortgage is $2,500 a month, and hey, I just don't have it. I can only afford a thousand dollars a month. What do you do? Yeah, you know that's a great question, and that would you would think would be the normal reaction of most people is if they can't make their full payment. They would call the lender or the bank, and they'd say, "Hey, I can't make my payment. I'm going to send you something," and, and that's a great way to start. But unfortunately, a lot of this stuff is counterintuitive, and because of certain legal issues. The lenders may accept the partial payments for a period of time, but eventually what's going to happen is they're going to start rejecting those payments. And again, it's counterintuitive. In, in my view, it's kind of foolish. I think the lenders should work with the homeowners more, but unfortunately they don't. So what ends up happening is once the homeowner falls a certain 
amount of uh, behind in their payments, and, and, and there's no set dollar amount, but eventually the lender will start rejecting the payments. And, oh, they, really? and they do what's called an acceleration, because when, when you borrowed the money, the lender um, agreed to take payments. But the agreement is if you don't make your payments on time, they can say, you know what, we're not obligated to take payments anymore. Now we want all the money. So they accelerate the debt. That's what it's called. And that's what gives them the right to foreclose on the home, uh, which in, in these cases is, has been put up as collateral for the for So the should people keep it? Because what I've seen, and I've tried to help a few people with this, is that if you're paying a little bit every month and you call the bank and say, look, I want to do a, a modification, they don't do it. So they don't really, really want to talk to you. But if you stop paying for three or four months, the phone rings and they say, hey, let's do a modification. Yeah, and in fact, you know, that's so, a great- so Is yeah. the best thing, I, I personally, when I, I'm not a lawyer, and I say, I think if you want to get, the, you want to get their attention, stop paying, put the money aside, because unfortunately people spend it, but try to put the money aside, stop paying. Is that wrong? No, no, that's not wrong. And you know, there are times when I advise clients to stop paying their mortgage. And in fact, if you call up, a mortgage lender or a bank or a servicer that's servicing one of these loans, they're going to tell you to stop making payments. Really? Many times they won't even help you if you're current or if you're only a, making partial payments. They're going to tell you outright, stop making payments. Now, I've seen that too. Somebody loses their job, they're current, but they know it's going to fall behind because unemployment doesn't cover it. And they call the bank and say, now sometimes I think they'll say, well, we'll give you a three month grace period. Yeah, well, here's what I tell people is that it's better to get an attorney involved sooner rather than later because okay, what's going to happen is the lenders are going to mislead and they do mislead very much the homeowners. So simply telling a homeowner to stop making payments can be a problem if the homeowner is not prepared to do uh, the right things and take the right actions. And unfortunately, most folks that are having financial problems when they start having these problems and they stop making their payments, they, they don't put aside any monies. Right. And or they don't have it to put aside. They don't have it to put aside, but also they, uh, you know, the lender will tell them, they may have some savings put aside, and the lender will tell them, stop making payments, or, or we're gonna defer some of, the, some of the monies or defer some of the payments, we're gonna give you a forbearance or you know, any number of possible things. But unfortunately, they don't always document it properly. And I, have, I can't tell you how many cases where I've represented homeowners who the lender said, stop making the payments and then we'll modify your loan. And then they don't modify the loan and they go ahead and start a foreclosure action. And then next thing you know, the homeowner's in much deeper than they ever thought they would be. Uh, and it's a big problem. So what do you do when you get that? Let's say you stop paying and a lot of people are watching this probably don't know to go to a lawyer. They couldn't find a lawyer. They say, well, I don't have any money, so how am I going to go hire a lawyer if it's not going to really help me? The, the end result is going to be the same, and, you, and you, they may be uh, in denial. Now you get the letter that says, we're, take, we're, we're starting the foreclosure process. And they go out, and, and you're saying to hire an attorney, they go out and hire you. And what, what do you do that would be different than them just say, if they just sit back and say, I'm throwing these letters in the mail, I see they're coming from the bank, and I'm throwing them in the garbage, and it's going to happen eventually. Well. You know, put, sticking your head in the sand and pulling the ostrich routine is probably the worst thing that a homeowner can do in, in this situation. Um, because if you do nothing, you know, you waive a lot of rights. They start a, a foreclosure action, it's a lawsuit. And if you don't respond, you're gonna waive all these rights and the bank's gonna steamroll over you in no time. So the, the, the bigger question you raised is a, is a great question. What do you do if you have no money? There are lots of uh, organizations out there and the Suffolk County Bar Association set up a, a program 10 years ago when this became a big problem. So they have a pro bono project. They also have a referral service. So I would suggest, you know, if a homeowner doesn't know of a foreclosure attorney, they can do a couple things. They can ask around because everybody knows somebody. Well, anybody watching this knows one now because they know you. Well, they do. <laughs> uh, but. Most folks that I speak to, everybody knows somebody who's having trouble with their mortgage. Absolutely. Uh, whenever I mention that to somebody, so you know, they can rattle off usually multiple names. So I would ask around and see if you, if you know somebody. If not, you can always call the Suffolk County Bar Association and ask for a referral, because uh, they have all kinds of assistance programs that are set up, and they have lists of referral services. But it's important to get uh, somebody who's knowledgeable on your side right away so they can guide you through the maze. Because once the legal stuff starts and you get served with legal papers, the worst thing, thing you can do is ignore it. 
Homeowners are entitled to a, a foreclosure settlement conference with the court. There's a law that was passed in 2008 when this uh, crisis really started. And those settlement conferences, which are overseen by the court, are so helpful in trying to resolve these really? things at an early stage. But how can you resolve it? What, what would be a good, re I mean, to me, if somebody sort of made the resolution that would be good, would, would be saying, you know what, for the next two years, just pay your taxes and then we'll figure it out. Hopefully they get uh, gainfully employed, they're not sick anymore, their divorce is settled. What is a good settlement? These people don't have money. If you have money, you're not, for the most part, you're not going to be sitting there in the settlement conference. Well, most of my client base, when, that, and for the cases that I handle with these, they've gone through a period of time where they've had a financial hardship. And when someone comes in to see me, I always say, let's talk about can you save your house and should you save your house? And most folks understand the can you save your house. They don't always understand the should you save your house. And we'll talk about that in a second. But the can you save your house really depends upon income. So the answer to your question is, by definition, if you don't have any income or insufficient income, it's going to be very difficult to save your house. So that goes to right. the can you save your house. Most of the folks that I meet with, they want to save their homes and they've gone through a temp temporary period of some type of financial hardship, whether it be a divorce or an illness or an, a period of unemployment or a period of underemployment. There's a whole variety of reasons why someone might not be able to pay their mortgage. Very, very few people just wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm not going to pay my mortgage right. today. Awesome. So it's, it's usually some kind of hardship that's temporary. So most of the time that hardship is either over or they expect it to be over at some point. So sometimes what I have to do is buy a little time until they can get back on their feet. Um, so if you have no income, you should still speak to an attorney because you may be able to buy some time until you can get back on your feet and, and right. get that going. Now the should you save your uh, house is a, is a completely separate analysis because it, that really relates in my view to the business aspect of it. A lot of people come in to see me and they have a lot of emotional ties to their homes and they want to save their house but many times the house is worth so much less than they owe the bank and we've seen this over the last 10 years because the, the property values went way up right. in 2006 2007 and then when the market crashed in 2008 the price the property values went through the floor but you still owed the money that you paid Right. for the house. So, you know, I, uh, I use an analysis and I use my hands when, when a client's sitting with me and I talk about the value of the house and, the, and the, what you owe the but bank. But could you renegotiate the value? Let's say you owe 100000 more, the banks are not going to get that. It, that if, you, if your house is worth <laughs> $500,000 and you owe seven, the bank is never going to get 700 for the house. Wouldn't they be better off saying, let's bring it down to, if you're going to walk, wouldn't they be better off saying, let's bring it down to the market value? Well, yes, but unfortunately, as the reality of it is that lenders are very, very reluctant to reduce the amount of the debt. You know, you again, you would think that's that's uh, something that common sense. They would say the property is worth less. Let's bring the debt down, but they won't do it. And and the reason they won't do it most of the time is because they don't want to encourage homeowners to miss their payments. Right. And that certainly would be an encouraging right. thing if people just, everybody starts defaulting but on their But do they want to foreclose? Well, you'd be surprised that uh, sometimes they do, you know, and, and there are a lot of factors as to when they do. Sometimes if there's equity in the house, I've seen um, sometimes the, the lenders will accelerate and they'll really try to push these foreclosures because they're trying to get the house to, right. or force a sale of it to, to get paid. But, you know, uh, there are laws now uh, that require the lenders to negotiate in good faith to try to help homeowners <coughs> save their home. And I use that law very, very favorably to homeowners because if we can show that the lender's not negotiating in good faith to help the homeowner, the, the courts can do any number of things to sanction the lender, including doing what you said and knocking down some of the- The courts can do that? The courts have the power to do that. They can't wipe out the debt completely, but they do have the power to abate some of the interest and, and abate some of the fees that have been charged. Right. Uh, they, they have a variety of remedies that they can and do. Do they do that? They absolutely do. Um, and I've had a number of cases like that where we've established that the lender is not acting in good faith to help the homeowner save their home. Uh, and after a hearing, the lender, uh, the, excuse me, the court will then impose any number of sanctions on the lender, including dismissing the foreclosure action. Which, which then what happens? Well, depending upon we where... We still owe the money, I'm assuming. They well, can't just stay there for free forever. Right? This is true, but there are ways to get the mortgages wiped out depending upon uh, where we are in the process and what 
where the, uh, the, the the lawsuit is in relation to the statute of limitations. You say getting it wiped out. You could actually get somebody who doesn't owe, they owe 300000 and then they owe nothing? The answer to that is yes. Shockingly, yes. Um, and, and well, that's it, certainly right there, even if it's a one in hundred chance it's worth hiring an attorney for that. Yeah, and I tell people it is it is something that doesn't happen very often. It's almost like winning the lottery. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and, and it's a combination of the lender has to make a bunch of mistakes and the homeowner and their attorneys have to realize these mistakes are being made and capitalize on the mistakes. And I can't tell you how many times I've had cases where the lenders have made multiple mistakes and we end up getting the foreclosure thrown out and then either the lender fails to start the second foreclosure action in time or that the statute of limitations has already passed by the time we have it dismissed and therefore they can't foreclose. So at that point the debt becomes uncollectible, the mortgage becomes unforeclosable and the homeowner essentially gets, as some judges like to say, a free house. Oh, interesting. So I hear people saying that they stay, and I, and I should say I hear people saying, I've seen people stay in their homes for years. Now I've seen people that they're out of their home in two years and I've seen people in certain areas that are in their home for 10 years and still going. It doesn't seem like there's a rhyme or reason. There's some people that are in, I would think if there's an area where there's high taxes and they're not being paid, the bank's paying these twenty, thirty thousand dollars taxes, I want to get this guy out right away because every three years is a hundred grand. But they don't. I have people in Dix Hills who have been there for years. It just doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason. What is the, what is the reason that some people stay for two years, three years, and some people stay for 10 years? without paying their mortgage. Yeah, and, and that's a great question. And there's no simple that's answer. That's why I get paid so much money. <laughs> <laughs> there's no simple answer to okay. that question. The, the, the answer essentially revolves around a number of factors. It depends on who the bank is, who the lender is, and how aggressive they are, and how aggressive their, their attorney is. It depends on who the homeowner's attorney is, and how knowledgeable they are in trying to either delay the case or just trying to fight the case. Uh, it depends on who the judge is who's assigned to the case. Uh, you know, unfortunately, there, there was a time when the courts were rubber stamping all these foreclosure actions. Right. And then, you know, uh, when the attorneys start picking apart the paperwork and pointing out all the problems, then there was the robo-signing sc scandal that happened, you know, a number right. of years ago. Um, and all of a sudden, every, the courts became very cautious. But, you know, the, the cases that tend to move quickly are the ones where homeowners ignore them. They don't do anything. Or they have someone who doesn't really know. You know, I've seen cases where attorneys have called me. They've tried to handle the case, and then they realize they're over their head. Yeah. They're over their head, and they say, hey, I need you to take this over. Uh, so, you know, if you don't have an attorney on your side who knows actually what they're doing, they could, that could be a problem. So also. could somebody come to you, Frank, and say, look, I don't have any money. I lost my job. I'm hoping in two to three years I'm going to get back on my feet. The problem is if I just move out of the house, I got to rent somewhere for 1500 I have kids in this school district. All I want you to do, Frank, is keep me in this house as, as long as you can do. Is that a service you provide? I've had plenty of, ca <laughs> I've had plenty of cases like that. Okay. And, you know, and there are times when uh, people come in and they think the situation is home hopeless. Uh, and then six months or a year or even two or three years later, things get better. Things get better. I, I represented uh, an elderly woman uh, a number of years ago who came to me. Her situation she thought was hopeless. She had cancer. She had lost her business. Her, her, her son-in-law, who she lived with, lost his job because he had an accident. Her daughter had a baby. So they had no income, really, to speak of. And it was one of those situations where just exactly what you said. Keep me in there as long as you can. And then I, I guess about two years later, she called me and said, hey, my cancer's in remission. I'm back <laughs> to work. My son-in-law's healthy. He's back to work. And my daughter-in-law got a part-time job. Do you think we can save the house? And the long story short is we absolutely saved her house. All right. So, it's not, so if, if you say, hey, keep me as long as you can, and five years later, this person's still in the house, and all of a sudden, maybe a parent dies and they get an inheritance or they get this great job, you know, you can go back to the bank and say, hey, they didn't pay for five years. Let's, let's save this house. Yeah, absolutely. And until the house is actually sold at auction, there's always the opportunity to, to, to save the house. And I've had, again, plenty of cases where at the beginning it seemed hopeless. And, you know, we, we get down the road, whether it's a year or five, right. and the situation has changed and we, we work something out with the lender. So what about the loan modifications that the banks will offer the person right away? Should they take them? Are they good? Uh, do they need, still need to go? Can, can you negotiate them or is it there's a program that the government I think there was, wasn't there an Obama thing to save, saving the home and that the banks had to offer a modification? 
is that something you should do on your own? Do you need somebody? Well, I mean, are they good? It's 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 like anything else. I mean, you could fix your car on your own. You can do a home repair on your own. But you know, doing legal work for yourself is generally not a good idea. And that's what a loan modification is. Essentially, it's 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 a contract. It's a legal agreement between you and the lender. So I tell everyone, at the very least, have it. Re reviewed by an attorney who knows what they're doing because right. I have seen people come to me and said, hey, I had a loan modification. The bank gave me a loan modification, but you know they're not doing what they're supposed to do. And then once I review the documents that they had signed months before that or a year before that, and I find that there are all kinds of problems. Uh, there are hidden clauses. There are all kinds of various things that I would never let them agree to if they had come to me with it, when it before they had signed it. Right. Uh, so. It's the kind of thing where you should always have it reviewed by an attorney, but there are a number of programs. Some of them have now expired, that they were uh, good through December of 2016, but uh, you know, the federal government did have a, have a bunch of plans for various loan modification plans, and then what ended up happening was uh, a lot of the lenders and the servicing agents that service those loans for them came up with their own plans that were similar to some of the federal plans that were being offered. So, you know, every lender and every servicer has their own programs. They have the federal programs and then they have their own programs. And most lenders, when you apply for a loan modification, will evaluate you for all the programs. And they'll say, hey, you don't qualify for this or you don't qualify for that, but you might qualify for this. Right, interesting. And I have a bunch of questions, but we only have five minutes. I'm going to try to go really sure. fast and just get the abbreviated. Of course, if somebody has questions, they can go to you. What if you're so underwater? I mean, we sort of touched on this, but you're so underwater on your house. Let's say you know you owe 700. The house is worth 500. It just doesn't make financial sense. What do you do? Can you, you renegotiate? Do you have to either pay it or let them foreclose and get out or do a short sale? It really depends on what the person's um, long-term goal is. And, and what I tell them is if you're, if you're inclined to stay in the house indefinitely. And if the house is not in a bad state of disrepair, then even though it might not make financial sense because the house is worth less than you owe, you might still want to do a loan modification. And I have okay. plenty of clients that say, I know it's not worth what I owe, but I don't really want to go anywhere. Or they have a, a kids in a school district right. and they need the kids to graduate. So there's a lot of different factors that go into that analysis. Boy, we're running out of time, and I got so much. I know I've, I know banks are paying people to move out of their house. I just had somebody, the bank offered him $13,000 to leave his house. Why do they do that, and how do you get that deal? Yeah, and, and it, the reason they do that is because they know that it gets the homeowner out a lot faster. So again, it, it depends on who the lender is and who the servicing agent is. It depends on the individual facts of the case. If it's a case that the lender, I, I got a phone call not long ago from a guy, the bank was willing to pay him $60,000 to move out, and it, the, ultimately boiled down to the bank had major problems with their paperwork, and I didn't think they could prove the, ca the case. And I actually, after speaking to the guy, I told him, don't take the 60000 wow. You'll You'll win your case. And uh, you know, he decided to follow my advice. So what is a defective foreclosure suit? Well, you know, again, the, the essence of a defective foreclosure essentially means that the paperwork isn't right. And, um, it can be any number of things wrong with a foreclosure. Either the lender doesn't really own the loan or they can't prove that they own the loan. That's called a standing defense. And I've seen a lot of cases when we have, that's, that's one of the biggest defenses we assert uh, in the cases that I handle is that whoever claims to own the loan or claims to be foreclosing, they don't really own it or they can't prove it. Does that, that happen if somebody looks at their mortgage payment it's from a Chase or a Bank of America or one of these other big, can that, is, it, is that even possible with one of these? Yeah, it's very possible. Uh, it's, it's impossible though for a homeowner to just know what to look so for. Go to an attorney. You really need to look at I mean, an I think the ba you know, what I'm getting out of this show, and we have a lot of stuff that I didn't go through, but what I'm getting out of it is at least consult. You know, spend $500 or whatever a consultation would cost and spend that money because it could be invaluable. Yeah, I, I would urge people to, to get a consultation. I give free consultations on oh, this okay. matter. Then you're crazy not to do it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's what I tell people. It, it doesn't hurt. You come in, we give you a one hour consultation for free. We go over it, we look at it. And one last thing I want to mention to you uh, that recently came to my attention. You mentioned J.P. Morgan Chase. If anyone watching this program has had a foreclosure action involving J.P. Morgan Chase over the last, say, five to ten years, they should really reach out to an attorney because there is a belief that those foreclosure actions may have some type of irregularity. And even if the foreclosure action is over, there may be something that an attorney can do. Uh, and certainly if it's pending, you need to speak to an attorney if you don't have one already. But uh, 
there, there are some major, there could be some major problems with some of the, some of the legal work. That Frank Romano, thank you very much. We had so much more to go through. Thank it's you. such a huge issue. People are watching the show. Uh, he doesn't have a website, but uh, just look, we'll put your number on the bottom of the screen, Frank Romano. You can call him up. That's your private one. That's that fine. Your, uh, look look up. Facebook. Yep. And as you said, there's thousands of Frank Romano, so you may not be able to uh, find you. But uh, anyway, look, look, look you up. Go for your free consultation. I'm Gary Jacobs, and thank you again for joining us Long Island Backstory. Please share this story. Very important. Everybody knows something going through it. Share this, get this useful information out, and we'll see you next week. Long Island Backstory. Chief Correspondent Gary Jacobs is uncovering the truth on Long Island. The family court system. Red light cameras. Corruption in local politics. The heroin epidemic. Corrupt judges. At Long Island Backstory, we uncover the truth that the Cablevision news monopoly won't dare touch. We uncover the details you won't see on News 12 or in Newsday. We are local independent media at its best. Long Island Backstory, available on Public Access TV and on YouTube. Long Island Backstory. Long Island Backstory. Long Island Backstory.